one o'clock, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, my goal here today is to share with you some of the things that I've shared with my staff, as well as throw our other ideas out onto the table, because I'm sure we all have different things that we've tried in our school, some that have worked, some that have not. The suggestions that I present today may not work in your districts, maybe that's not something that you feel that you could try, but maybe it's something different that you could try. And the first thing that I want to do, which is going to probably freak a few of you out, but I'm going to do this on purpose and you'll see my point in a little bit here, but I want everybody to put their devices down. So if you got your computer open, close it, and I know everybody's like in panic mode, because I would be, because like I have like three things here and I'm like doing one 50 minute presentation. But I want you to put it away, because that's classroom management. There is no place does it say that just because a student has a device in their hands that you're still not the teacher in front of the classroom. You are still the person that can tell them, yes, now we need to open our devices, we need to get on, go to this website, log on to your accounts, whatever the, whatever the case may be. But you still have that ability. Now, I think everybody listened, which never happens, but everybody did, it looks like. And you always, sometimes in that classroom, you have somebody that doesn't. So as a teacher, one, a tactic you could try is simply going up to that person. Obviously, I'm talking loud, but I wouldn't do that probably in the classroom. But and say to them, you know, it's okay. Sometimes I don't hear the first time either. It was pretty noisy in here. Please close your device. They still don't do it. You as a teacher, this is what I tell my staff. You can go up. We have Chromebooks. Gently close their lid. I ask you to close your device. It was amazing to me how many teachers in my district felt like they couldn't do that. And in my mind, you're still the person in charge of your class. That device does not entitle them to do anything they want at any time. It gives them the ability, but I don't agree that it entitles them to do that. So if you need them to do something that you're wanting to work on, then you need to do that. Now the other thing you might hear from a student, you know, this is stupid. You know, why do we have to do that? We probably have heard it. I hear it all the time in my district. You know, some things that you can say back to that, you know, I'm sure you have your reasons for thinking about that, but now is not the time. But I'd be more than willing to talk with you after class and you can share some thoughts. You know, it's kind of the opposite approach rather than try to get them upset with you or you take on the defense that, you know, this is not stupid, this is my class and this stuff's important, listen. Okay, you're kind of taking the opposite approach. Does it work with every single kid? Probably not, but hopefully, majority, continue to do it. It's a constant in your classroom, it might work. Another thing that I hear a lot of times is, oh, I hate these Chromebooks. I don't get why the school bought all these Chromebooks that we have. They, of course, would prefer we each got the beautiful MacBook Airs, thousand bucks or more pop. For our district, that was not a possibility. The kids don't kind of get that. They just think it's a big pot of money. So if someone tells that to you, you might respond with, you know what, and you, you still use them, though. You hate them. They're stupid but you still choose to use them to complete your assignments. That is terrific. That must take a lot of courage for you to have to open that Chromebook instead of have a brand spanking $1,200 MacBook Air on your desk. But you know what? If you have some suggestions for the tech department, I'd be happy to share them with the tech department. So after class, if you want to share them with me or go to the tech department and give some thoughts to them on ways that maybe you could um, you know, improve the Chromebook use. That's something else that you can do. Just, it's just looking at it from a different lens. And we all know there's some that it'll work, and some that you're like, no, I would never try that. You know, in the last one, you're gonna have that really defiant one that says, I'm not doing it, you can't make me. You go figure it out, I'm not, I, you can't tell me I can't have this open. And you could respond, you know what, that is a great refusal. That is spectacular. If anybody ever tries to get you to do something inappropriate, wants you to help them cheat on a test, I hope you remember that same attitude and say it just like that. You can't make me. I'm not going to help you do that. 
That's an idea, a suggestion. Is it a little off the wall? Can be. Can it work? Yes, it can work. You can get your devices up now. I just wanted to kind of role play that a little bit with you. Today's presentation, like I've already suggested, is simply some ideas. I gave you some here right now, and some of the information that I'm going to share with you is, is not any whiz-bang magical thing that I have come up with on my own. I've stolen from other people that have, have uh, thought of it before me, and I've just pulled in the resources together to help, it, help you feel more comfortable in your classroom. It's also posted on the iTech uh, site. The second one is a link to today's meet. I've created a room for us to put in questions. If you have questions, I'll look at that and try to answer. Or if other people go in that room and if you know the answer, feel free to chime in there. It's an also a place for you to ask questions. It's a place for you to give your ideas. Maybe you know there's something you have thought of while you're here at the conference that you've heard somewhere else and we could put this all together and we can all bring all those resources together. <coughs> everybody, did I give everybody a chance to get those links? <clears throat> all right. I truly believe this quote right here. We do need that technology in every classroom because it is the pen and paper. I've been an uh, educator for 20, I think it's my 22nd year, and it has changed immensely from my first year as an educator till today. It's changed dramatically from when I was in high school. When I was in high school, it, my senior year, we finally got the Mac Pluses, that little box, and you had the floppy disk, was jealous because I had already taken data processing and I didn't get to take it with the new ones. But so we need to look through that technology and figure out ways that we can pull that into our classrooms and use it um, to improve learning. But with that, and this is the piece that sometimes I think we get hung up on, just like how we teach students how to use pen and paper. We have to teach them the use of technology and not just how to turn it on, not just all the cool um, programs that you have out there, not all the cool gadgets, but how to really use it. What's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Those ethical things, those do's and don'ts kind of questions that I think we take for granted. I know a lot of times by the time people get to high school, the students get to high school, the teachers think they know all those things, and of course the kids kind of think they do too, but they really don't. You still need to keep going on and helping them guide them. This is a no-brainer to me. If you already have good classroom management, a piece of technology is not going to mean all of a sudden your, your management style is out, out the door. Does it make things change a little bit? Definitely. If you focus on good instruction, which, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, that should be your focus. Rather than how am I going to keep them off of YouTube? How am I going to keep them off of Netflix? I don't want them to play games. What can I do differently? It's, it's all about how you design your instruction in ways that you can keep your students, which is, comes to the next ones, to be engaged and challenged. It means coming up with some other ideas. They want to be on their technology devices. Can you come up with some reasons that coordinate with your lesson that use those tools? So they're on their devices, but they're doing something for education, not to text and to do Facebook and tweet. All those other things that sometimes students get, or not students, but teachers get kind of concerned about. And the other thing is, technology is not your enemy. 
It's there to help you. It's help you improve your instruction, which in the end should help improve learning. But it's very easy for right away, that's the first problem. Oh, those Chromebooks. You know, I didn't have to deal with this before Chromebooks. The kids weren't on, they weren't on games before Chromebooks because when I was teaching, they didn't have anything in front of them. And now they do, okay? It's not necessarily that it's wrong, and I think sometimes we need to look at, okay, what can we change differently about how we're teaching to make sure that they're not going off course. Okay, now some strategies that you might take back with you, and I wish I could remember who I stole these from, because I can't take credit for them. I got it off of a listserv, and I can't remember which one it was. But there's three strategies that I'm presenting to you. The first one is the two eyes act. Watching the students, seeing what they're doing. If they know that you're perusing, walking the classroom, seeing what they're doing, sitting at the back of the room instead of in the front of the room, looking at their, the backs of their screens, they're going to notice. The second one is the two feet extension. Okay, it's a great extension because it, not only does it keep your kids on task, but it's part of the wellness program because you're walking around, you're not staying up front, you're not standing in the same place nonstop. And the last one, MBWA, management by walking around, okay? Which is a lot like the two feet extension. Those are the strategies that I push to begin with because I hear it all the time which I don't know if I've said or not, I'm the tech coordinator. I hear from my staff all the time, well, you know, such and such school is using this program. There, you know, this other program, other school, someone that I know that teaches at that school, they have a program where they can see what's on everybody's device at all times. And those are great, and they are very cool to, to have and see, but they do cost money. And unfortunately for schools, most of us, it is not a, an easy, um, or an open pot of money at all. There's a couple that I know are familiar, probably some of you may already have them. One of them is GoGuardian, and one of them is Hapara. I'm not familiar with Hapara. GoGuardian, we have purchased, um, I think through the IC, it was like $5.50 a license. I might be off a little bit on that, but I believe it was $5.50 for each user, for each device. So we have, 500 and some Chromebooks so that we had to buy a license or a, a license for each one of those. They just came out this fall with the ability to have the teacher go guardian portion of it where you could, if you want to buy into the next level, you know, it's not a, you paid the first price and now you, just, this just comes along with it. It's an addition you have to pay for. But it allows it basically for what I as an administrator could see, teachers can also see then then some. So they can see little thumbnails of their students' um, devices to know what they're working on at that particular time. We are just starting to give it a look um, and do the 30-day trial to see whether it be anything that we're interested in. Um, I push the other free things because I still think it's classroom management. And if I, I can give you these tools, but in my mind that I'm taking you away from your teaching. Because now I'm expecting you to look at your computer and be watching what they're doing um, when they're right there in front of you. Not saying it's wrong, but there, there are you know, different things to think about there. The cost being the main one, and if you're in a little district, um, that's not always a possibility. They're out there. Does anybody have the Go Guardian in your district? Have you looked at the, te the teacher portion? Do you have it? I mean, are you using it? Or? We're in the process of negotiating that price. Okay. And is that about five, six? Oh, it is seven. Yeah, that's what they eventually started for. Okay, yeah. But it's nice because we've looked at it a little bit. We've been on 30 trial. Just get that a little bit. All right, so does anybody use Hapara? That was kind of the biggie. Hapara, I, I, I think, was great, and it uh, probably is great. I just haven't used it, but 
districts that I know of that have used it, a lot of them have said it's very cumbersome and there's a lot of background work, behind the scenes work that has to be done. The one thing what I've seen with Go Guardian is that it looks like they've kind of weeded through all that fuzzy stuff about how to get it set up into your classes. It works a lot like Google Classroom where the teacher kind of has a code and then you have your students go to this, um, this um, and then they have to type in that code to be um, put under your name, so to speak, and then the teachers can see their, their students that are in their course. And then I think they just came out, because this is when the salesman was on the phone with me, I said, okay, so what do you do with that kid that says, are you kidding me? I'm not going to, I'm not gonna go there because then they're gonna watch me. You know, if nobody's gonna force me, I'm not gonna do that. And, uh, and he, it wasn't at the time, and he didn't have it, but he says it's in the works that they're making it that you could enroll the students yourselves, I think by email. I don't know if you, um, and I got an email not too long ago that said that that's what they're doing, which I think that's great because, you know, not that you want to be sneaky about it, but yet you know that there's going to be those few kids that are going to try to get away without it. Um, another management strategy <coughs> that we can pull in is just using a timer. And I was going to set a timer, and now I see that I've started, and I didn't start my timer, but I have one ready to go. Um, but give them that a time frame. Say, okay, we're going we're gonna to work on our Chromebooks or our devices for the next 30 minutes. When the timer goes off, now we're going to transition into the next activity. Give them. It helps them keep on track. It helps the teacher keep on track as well. And then on this, this is just when I did a search on Google Chrome. Those are some apps and extensions that you could get off of Google. Up in the top right corner, I've got links to Online Stopwatch, which is one that I like. It's either a countdown or a timer, and I like those. And then the second one is just a Google search of timers. When I typed in Google and looked for timers, it had a whole slew of them. And even at the very top, there's already, you know, Google has their built-in timer that you could just use that too. So they're readily available. You know, and teach your kids to use those. You know, say, you know, if you only want to be on it for so long, you know, you go to a website, you start a timer so that they can kind of be in charge of it. Um, make sure you set expectations. And here again, to me, these are no brainer thing, but for some reason, when we bring in technology, we think that it's different, it's new, it's, it's not the same, and really it is. You come up with and you tell them what you're going to accept in your classroom and what you're not going to accept. So one of them is um, the hands-on, hands-off. I mean, you can use different things, and I've got some other words that you can throw out there with kids that are on the devices. But, um, you know, if you have it, if you tell them on day one, okay, if I come up to you because I notice you're on games, you're off task or whatever, if I close the lid, if my hand touches your screen or your device, you can't open it again. It's in timeout. And I think it's important that we we kind of move the focus, not tell, not, it's not the kids timeout, which it kind of is, but we focus and say it's the technology timeout because that technology is distracting them right now. Okay, and we want to get them back on task. So if you if you follow through with that and are consistent, I closed it, I don't want you to have that open again until I come back and I open it for you. That's a strategy you could try. We all have those few kids that can't seem to get it. We had one student that I finally had to take Facebook <coughs> away from them because they just couldn't, couldn't handle it. We have it open in our district. They could not deal with that. They were constantly on Facebook and no matter what we tried to do to get them to, to uh, realize that they need to find more educational things to do or not do it during class, um, finally had to Sorry, you can't be on there. Um, share your expectations and guidelines and allow them to also, you know, have a little bit of say in that. So maybe you want to have a class meeting. I know that that tends to be heard more that elementary teachers do that, but I think you could do that in middle school and high school as well. Have a class meeting and say, okay, what do you think? What would be fair? What are some guidelines or some expectations that I should have of you with these devices? And what do you think you're, you think would be fair between the two of us? Let them have a little say in that. The other piece of this is to think about your own use of technology. 
And this one is usually a kicker because when you're the administrator, you get to see a lot of things behind the scenes. And there's a lot of things that you see, not only about students, but about your staff and where they're going on the web, the things they're doing on the web. We, we're pretty open to uh, things on the internet, you know, of course, unless they're illegal and immoral. But, you know, we don't block Amazon. We don't block a lot of shopping sites. But I can tell you probably almost at least 75% of my staff at one point or time is shopping online during school. I don't know, is that appropriate? Probably 99% of them are checking their school email and their personal email. But yet, when the kids are doing it, some people get really riled about that. Well, they're on their personal account, block it. I had that happen because uh, we're a Google school and they all have their school accounts. Well, then they figured out, well, now I could add my Gmail account. So they were flipping back and forth. And I guess I don't have a huge issue with it, but I did have some staff that, that didn't like that. And they said, block it. We don't want them able to do that. I said, well, how am I going to do that? If I block Gmail, now I got, a, I got Yahoo Mail, I got Hotmail, I got all these other resources. There's no way. You, and anybody that's, I don't know, the tech coordinators in here, you block one, they just find another site. Now you block YouTube, they got something else. Netflix, I discovered there's other places just like Netflix, and the kids, they, they find it just like that because they were watching Netflix during class. So I blocked it. It wasn't it half an hour and, and I was seeing kids saying, oh, go here and you can watch video for free. And so it's a vicious cycle and it's, I don't know, you just have to weigh it out, I guess. But think about your own use. You know, do you have your phone out on your desk all day long, but yet you tell the kids to put it away? Do you walk down the hallway with your cup of coffee, but yet you tell the kids no drinks? I mean, it's, it's kind of hard because we do one thing and then we expect them to do another one. Back to the guidelines. Some things that you could, you could do is present to them what's acceptable. You know, um, if you're done with your work early, these are some things that I would find acceptable for you to do on your Chromebook. <coughs> you could be using it to check your email. You could say uh, that they can finish their other assignments that require the computer. They could read an online book. I just have three examples. But you could, you know, kind of set it up for them that says, okay, here's the three, three things. Or, I mean, it could be a whole list for that matter. But here are the things that I see that are acceptable. If I see you going here, that's acceptable. And maybe depending upon where you're, what you're teaching, you know, maybe games is open, open. Now, I have a different opinion on games because some of them, I don't understand, you know, the mindless ones that they just click, that I don't really get. I don't understand what you possibly get out of that one, but there are some that are very popular. But if you're doing Minecraft, some of these more thinking type games, those I don't have such a problem with. So I, I think when people say, you know, no games, that, eh, that's kind of a broad area. If you really want to say no games or all games, but you can come up with some ideas. The other thing that I try to, to push through my staff is to come up with what are some school-wide guidelines that we can come up with so that no matter whose room I'm in, we all know that it's the same. So then I don't have the problem that, well, when I'm in Mrs. McCardle's room, it's okay for us to be on Netflix. And when I'm in Mr. Strew's room, he says we can't have our phones out. I mean, and I'm sure every district has that, where you've got some teachers that are very open and free, and then you have some that are like locked down, don't, don't do anything beyond what I say type things. I'm not saying either one is wrong, but if you can find some that are school-wide, uh, we had a little bit of trouble with this one. Um, because it's hard, because everybody's different. So some people had different opinions there. Some examples that I have on there, you know, to me, something that could be definitely school district wide, um, you know, if you're using your camera to take pictures without people knowing it, 
and you're posting them, that's not appropriate at any point in time. That to me is an easy guideline. Um, totally unacceptable for you to be taking pictures in bathrooms. And we did have that happen in our district. The kids thought it was funny. And they posted it on <coughs> You know, if you could, if everybody's on the same field and you say <coughs> we're playing games, when I'm up here instructing or when we're learning something new or you're supposed to be doing an, a, a group project, you know, playing games is not acceptable. It's kind of letting them know what is, what isn't. This next slide, I've created a padlet. And here, here again, part of my presentation today is to give you some ideas of things that you could also use in your classroom. But today's chat, that's a back channel. That's another way for you to keep your kids hopefully on task. That it lets them be using their technology, but using it for their, their education, for their learning, not just for their entertainment at the time. Now, is it guaranteeing it? No, you'll still have some that venture off, but hopefully the majority will stay on task. Okay, so this is um, Padlet. And if you haven't heard of Padlet, it's basically a um, cork board, bulletin board, <coughs> and you can post, I call them sticky notes, and put, um, put them on the board so you can share ideas. So my, my question or my thought up there is for you to share any ideas that you would have for better classroom management. I presented you with a few, and I've got some more to come. I better see, check on my time, I'm about to be running out. Um, but here's just a place for you to share. So here again, if you're back in the classroom and you're, you know, whatever your topic is that you're talking about and you want students to be participating, but you want them to be engaged and not, you know, while you're talking, you don't want them to venture off to other websites, this would be another place, another idea that you could have. So they could be back channeling, here you're incorporating this, so you're asking a question, you're saying, okay, this is what we're talking about. Now I want you to be sharing it with the rest of the group. So it, it, it kind of it entices them, it gets them involved, and hopefully keeps them on task. A little better than normal. So and then this, the Padlet is free. Um, and you just have to share that website and then anybody can get to it. I'm not sure how long it's up there, if it's indefinite. I know today's chat is only for a certain time. Like I put the one for today was for a month. But both today's chat and Padlet are free. And those, so keep adding your ideas as we go through. And um, when you go back to school tomorrow, I mean, that'll still be on there, so if you pull up the on my website, you can go to this address. You'll still see that. Um, some things here. In our district, it's becoming uh, more and more that kids are bringing their iPods to school, their devices, they're listening to music. And it's, it's uh, normal for me to see kids walking down the, he the hall with their headphones and their, ear their earbuds in. Um, to me, it's important for you to get to cross with the kids when that's okay and when that's not okay. You know, it sometimes bothers me when I'll say hello to a kid and I'll try to start a conversation and then they're like, huh, what? You know, they can't. Um, but I think here, the thing to present to them is not because it's wrong for them to listen to music in school, but that you should give people attention. I mean, we still need that face-to-face -face communication, and I think that is one thing that technology is hurting a little bit because kids don't know how to talk to you when you're face-to-face, -face, but they sure know how to type and tell you stuff. It's a whole different world on what they'll say to your face versus behind the scenes. So that's another strategy for you to pass on to your kids. You know, it's fine if you allow them to have music, but just know those are going to be out when I am giving directions. Um, some ideas or some ways for you to tell how kids are off task, and there's probably um, a whole other list that you could add to this, and you've probably seen it once in a while. 
you'll be up in the front of the classroom and you can just tell their, their eyes are just fixated on the screen and they are glued to whatever they're looking at. And sometimes we all know, depending upon what we're teaching, that sometimes our subject matter probably is not that intriguing that they're just staring right at it. So that would be a sign for you to maybe take a little walk and see well, what's going on back here. Um, they might be typing off normal pace. Maybe they're taking notes, the rest of the class is leisurely typing away, and they're just going like mad. So obviously they have something they're passionate about. If it's passionate about your subject matter, that's fantastic, <coughs> but sometimes that's a sign that they might not be the same. Uh, reactions or emotions, we've all been with somebody who was looking at their phone and they burst out laughing and you're just like, I missed the joke, I don't know what just happened here. Um, but those are the other things that you might notice when, when kids um, are off task on their devices. Um, identify who your kiddos are if you have problems with the devices. That can help because sometimes that's what throws off our schedule and gets the kids off task because you know you've got three kids over here that can't get online or they can't um, figure out how to get Padlet to open or whatever it might be um, and so then you stop and so then you've got the rest of the class that seems to take a detour and, and gets off task as well. So maybe set up in your class, who are your key people that are fairly techy that you could you know, say, okay, you need to go help so and so right now so that I can continue on with my instruction. That also will help. This seems silly, but I think it does make a difference, but to practice with your kids, and I know in the high school it seems awfully silly, but Sometimes that's what it takes. We had kids that didn't understand how to walk to the lunchroom. You would swear we have Pizza Hut and McDonald's and Burger King, the whole shenanigans of food court, because the kids would run down the hall. So we had to take a couple of days, and the teachers walked the students down to the lunchroom, explaining to them this is how we need to, to do this next time, not just run down like a herd of elephants. Practice those techniques you want them to follow. Our middle school have Chromebooks. Obviously, they're a little easier to work with. The first week of school, um, when they're not using them during the day, they put them in their lockers. So we have teachers that the first week of school, that's what they're doing, is they're purposely practicing, saying, okay, we're gonna go out to the hallway and we're gonna put them into the lockers. And I want you to practice where it's going to go. As we have told them, they have to have it at the top of the locker. They are kind of a tight fit, so there is, you know, kind of a little bit of a technique to it, and they practice that. Um, even plugging them in needs practice. You would think such a simple thing would not be that difficult, but I'm always amazed at the end of the day when I go into te teachers' classrooms and I look at their carts and I'm like, how do you know where anything is? Half of them are unplugged or they put them in the wrong spots. Um, so practice that skill with, that, with the students. Um, I've already alluded to this. We've talked a little bit about today's meet. I've got one going in the background with us. Um, it's another way for you to keep those kids engaged in what you're doing in the classroom um, so they're not doing those off-task behaviors. I tell the staff in our district that, you know, we are, I guess I consider our, our district a tech-friendly environment. We're one-to-one, -one, uh, fourth grade through twelfth grade. Our um, elementary, we are not in a one-to-one -one situation, but we just um, started with um, iPads uh, due to some STEM initiatives. So we kind of made that move for our elementary. Um, and so we're not one-to-one, -one, but we're probably at least three to one. So for every three kids, we have one device for them. Um, but remember, back to what I said before, it's not an entitlement just because they ha we are tech friendly, just because they have that device doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want. And sometimes I know for a fact that kids think that, but we as educators have to remind them that there's a time and a place for everything. And you as a teacher still have that right to discipline your students. So, and granted, I guess I can't speak for every district because maybe you're told to handle things differently. But in mine, I, I tell them, 
if, the, if you've warned the student and they cannot understand that you want them to, whether it be to close their device or for them to not go on that website and, and you want them to be doing something else in your classroom, you have that authority to take that Chromebook and say, if you cannot follow the rules, if you cannot meet my expectation, I'll hold this to the end of the class. Now give it back to them. I don't, I don't tell them to just take it and keep it. I had a little trouble with that last year that I had some teachers that they felt like they could just take them and then they, they wouldn't let the kid have them for the rest of the day which in some respects is good for the student, but it hurts the other teachers who have lessons planned and they're figuring that every kid has their Chromebook and then you come and you've got a couple kids without them and now what do, what do I do with those kids? So I try to push, you can take it during your class time, but unless it's something that's above and beyond, you know, granted there are those instances if it's you know, they're looking at inappropriate pictures. Um, you know, they're doing something that's unethical. Obviously, yes, that's totally different. Then you need to be contacting your principal or your tech coordinator. So that alludes to this slide, which is, you know, bad behavior is still bad behavior. And these will be instances that we feel, because they're breaking the, well, our acceptable use policy. If they're breaking acceptable use policy, then that's different than them just being off task in your classroom. So if they're doing any of these four things, yes, that's different. You sure take that and you don't give it back to them until the principal or the tech coordinator have, have uh, investigated it a little bit to see whether or not we need to keep that or not. Some other ideas that you could pull into your classrooms. One is simply tell them, you know, close the lid, maybe that's your phrase that you say when you're, you're, you're needing them to have their attention on you, not on whatever's on their screen. You have that be your, your line. Um, lids up, lids down. That's the one that we use in our district. Um, make signs, post it everywhere so kids get it that this, that's what all the teachers are doing. So no matter whose room I'm in, when they say lids up, lids down, that's what they're talking about. Another idea is um, some districts have used 45 as their magic word. So when they hear the word or the number 45, students close their screens at a 45 degree angle. Now we didn't pick this one because our staff said, well then we'll get into all these debates about is this 45 or is this 80 or no, this is 20. And so they just wanted an all or nothing. It's either up or it's down. Um, and then the last one on that page is hands on hands off, um, and I use that even when I was in the technology for the elementary kiddos, you know, they, you know, we would do the um, crisscross applesauce, hands in the bowl type thing. Um, they, um, some of you chuckled, so I know you've heard it before, um, you know, keep your hands off of the device when I'm giving instructions, and a lot of times with your little ones, you have to do that too, because they're too excited about pressing buttons. Another suggestion is um, when the bell rings before class, you could initiate that your procedure or your expectation is that those Chromebooks are closed. But here again, it's dependent upon you and how you run your class. We have some teachers, um, we, you always have to have an exception, and our exception is unless the teacher tells you differently. But when the bell rings, that's what we're going to expect is that you have your Chromebooks closed so that you can be listening to the teacher's directions because the beginning of class is usually when we take attendance and we figure out, um, you know, what we did yesterday. We do a review and we keep move on to the next area of what's happening in class. Here again, these are just suggestions. The other, another one that you could do, which I cannot get my staff to agree with, but I thought of the idea because in our district. It seems like the last few minutes of class, for whatever reason, the kids, you know, they're done, they're closing their books, no matter if they're done with their assignment or not. And a lot of times they even stand by the door, which is a big pet peeve of mine, but it's not my room. Um, but I wanted to pass this last three to five minutes of class, because a lot of times they are just sort of milling around. Have that be when they check email. 
Let that be their downtime, so to speak. Let that be when they're checking their text, because you know they're probably already doing it in your classroom anyway, but if you gave them a specific time, maybe they would limit the other time when you don't want them to be doing it. But that didn't pass in my district, but maybe it'll work in yours. So here again, I'm gonna ask you to return to that Padlet, and is there, and think about, I've kind of given you some, you know, just some other, I guess, little words or ideas on what you could do um, that are routine things in your classroom so kids follow that. Does anybody have any thoughts? I mean, share that on Padlet, but does anybody want to talk about something maybe you already use in your classroom or your district does? I have a question. Okay. So do you have any district-wide communication, can a student be on their computer inappropriately in period one, period three, period five, and is there any communication between your teachers to say, hey, you know, this kid's just off task completely? Yes. Is there some reporting system or something? We don't. We need to figure out something. That was actually brought up in a meeting we had at the end of last year's, our first year one to one, was and that was part of the, the thing that the teacher that was taking the Chromebooks and holding it for the entire day, she felt like, you know, that kid deserved that punishment. And then, and I, we kind of, after we talked with all the staff, I guess they felt like, yes, they do communicate. And there have been instances where, um, you know, usually those kids aren't traveling that far to the next room that the teachers can easily either you know face to face say you know hey Susie is was doing this in my class period the other thing that we do do when I have teachers that are suspecting that the kids are not where they're supposed to be we have that go guardian we don't have the teacher dashboard but we have the regular and I can look up their history and print out where those students have gone <coughs> and what time, it tells you what time they're there and what time they go off of it. So it gives you a good idea to know that, yep, during English, they were here, here, and here. They were not where you thought they were. Um, so we do have that too. Does the Chromebook ever get taken away? In class, yes. And um, even by, um, our, our middle school principal is very good about that. If, if kids are doing things habitually, constantly, then yes, they do get taken away for a length of time. Any other questions or comments, things that you've done, things that you, you've seen other teachers use in your district that's, that helps with the management of the devices? Okay, now I'm not gonna go over this, but this is something that I found online that I thought made a lot of sense. Um, or some tech, tech tips for teachers, things as you try to bring that into your classrooms and, and manage everything with your students. Um, and so I just share that with you here. Um, education is changing a lot and I, I really enjoyed our keynote this morning because I thought he hit a lot of, a lot of things that are very true about our districts and our schools today, that we, we do get a lot of pushback from teachers and staff because it's change, it's different, it's not how we were taught. Um, I hear a lot of, you know, I've taught here for 25, 30 years, and those kids that graduated 10 years ago, that they, you know, they're doing this, this, and this, you know, that worked, you know, how we taught then, and, and it did. Nobody's saying that those ways didn't work, but it's changing. Technology makes everything different. The social media aspect is huge, and how you can communicate and you can, you know, get the message across to thousands of people, mere seconds. So our thing that we need to think about is: is this big, massive change, and that not only do we have to get our kids engaged in our curriculum but just in school wanting to come what's that what's that piece that that they connect with that makes them 
want to come to school. Um, our district does a lot um, with STEM initiatives, and I know last year I had a science teacher, and uh, he was doing um, Project Lead the Way, and he also does First Step Challenge. And he had a girl who normally misses probably anywhere from 10 to 20 days of school. And she was coming to school because she liked working with the robotics. She was, that was her passion at the time. That was her class. And, as, and his class was like an hour. I think it was only a six week. I think they were running a hex. And then he wondered, because then she wasn't missing any school. And then after that six weeks hex, then she went back into her old routine and she was missing school all the time. So I think it does make a difference if we can just find, find those connections. Um, resources, this is where I stole all my information. I cannot give credit to myself for any of what I shared with you. Um, and then finally, just a thank you for attending. I'm hoping that you got something out of today's session. Um, continue, if you've got ideas, please add them to the today's meet. If you have questions, I'll be looking at that here shortly. Um, have any other comments or questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them.